Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Medicinal Monday. I'm Dr. Benjamin Alter. I'm Dr. Susanna Alter. And we're both naturopathic doctors who support people in optimizing their health and thriving on plants, specifically whole food, plant-based nutrition. And we also support people in understanding their mindset and how mind empowers health. Um, and today on our Medicinal Monday, we're going to be talking about gluten, which is a topic that came up in our private Facebook group, Plant-Based and Stress-Free. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can feel free to come on in to the Plant-Based and Stress-Free Facebook group where we host these calls and so much more. Um, but before we get into the gluten thing, Dr. Susanna, would you like to share the exciting announcement? The exciting announcement is that we are just one week away from our next free whole food plant-based challenge. This time we will be focusing on detoxification and liver health. So to register for that, head over to alter.health slash WFPB dash detox dash series. You can, of course, Isn't find a whole food plant based challenge detox series. Yes, we'll make sure to include <laughs> the link so you can we'll find it. Yeah. Yes, but we hope that you join us for that. Again, it's a free event in our plant based and stress free group. We're also uh, leading up to that challenge. We have a giveaway within the group. You can join the giveaway in order to yeah. uh, enter a drawing to win a $50 gift card. Cool. All right. Well, hope to, hope to see you starting next Monday in the Whole Food Plant-Based Challenge. But now on to today's topic, which is the topic of gluten, which is that protein that everyone has been pretty obsessed about for, oh, a couple decades now. Um, but Dr. Suze, do you want to maybe start by just talking about what gluten is and where we find it? Sure. Yeah. So gluten is a protein. It's a particular protein that is found in a few grains. And it's actually the protein that helps uh, to give dough kind of that nice stretchy consistency, like, you know, pizza dough, for okay. example. Yeah. But anyway, it's it's found in grain or it's found in wheat, barley and rye. Those are the three glutinous grains. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny because the way that we relate to gluten um, is like gluten is such a major part of the diet. How yeah. do we live without gluten? <laughs> it's, it's like, I, I, you know, <laughs> you can see applesauce or something that says gluten free. And it's like, well, I hope my applesauce doesn't contain wheat, barley or rye. Why would it? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it was kind of a running joke in Portland where we went to medical school. There was a strip club that had a billboard on the on the by the way. Fun fact, Portland, ha at least in the past, had the highest number of strip strip clubs per capita than any other city. Fun fact, I'm glad you, you I'm sure you're glad you know that now. Uh, but anyways, in Portland, there was a, a strip club that had a sign like on a main street that said gluten free lap, da lap dances. And that just shows you the marketing power of gluten and gluten free items. Yes. Um, so anyways, gluten is a protein that is found in three foods, specifically wheat, barley and rye. And what's the issue? What's the problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, gluten has gotten an extremely bad reputation over the years because, of course, individuals have been diagnosed with celiac disease, which yeah. is an autoimmune condition where the body cannot tolerate gluten or else it starts attacking its own intestinal cells. So I was meant to do some f f uh, fact finding and find the actual statistics of the actual percentage of the population that has celiac disease, and I failed to do so. I know that it's been fairly constant. There might be an, a slight increase in individuals diagnosed with celiac disease. Do you have any idea what it is? I think it's, I think it's less than 1%. Um, I think it's around 0.5%, so less than one out of 100 people have a celiac disease. Um, but there's the issue of what people have been calling or doctors have been calling non-celiac gluten sensitivity, mm -hmm. um, which is just like any other food sensitivity. It's where there is an, uh, an, an immunologic reaction to the gluten protein. And now people can have immunologic reactions to any number of foods. Uh, but as we point out in the context and understanding of other food sensitivities and quote unquote food allergies, which are not really food allergies, they're food sensitivities, 
the the food is not the issue it's the uh intestinal lining it's the microbiome it's the digestive system and as we create resilience and fortify the health of the microbiome um, then we uh, say goodbye to all of these food sensitivities and i know dr susanna you've had experience with that personally um, but gluten is is kind of a pesky food sensitivity and I think it's worth talking about why gluten is a little unlike other food sensitivities. Right. And why it's one of the more common proteins that people develop a sensitivity to. Yeah. Um, so really, one of the biggest reasons why gluten is one of these trickier compounds is because if we look at the grains that contain gluten and we look at the way that they've been grown and harvested, we see that the bulk of, let's just talk about wheat, because let's be honest, that's the yeah. most common gluten containing grain that Americans eat. Um, if we look at the way that wheat has been grown and harvested, one really crucial important step to understand is that in the harvesting of wheat, the wheat fields are typically any kind of conventional wheat field is actually sprayed with a particular herbicide in order to actually kill the wheat to make it easier to harvest. Now, yeah. this process is called desiccation. Yeah, specifically, um, it's killing, but also drying the wheat, allowing mm -hmm. the wheat to dry because the wheat grains can be harvested only when they are sufficiently dried out. So that is the process of desiccation. Right. Yeah. And this process of desiccation allows farmers to maybe even get two harvests or three harvests within one season. Yeah. Um, but it requires the use of these herbicides. And specifically, the one herbicide that we're going to highlight in today's discussion is Roundup. And the active ingredient in Roundup is called glyphosate. Yeah. This particular chemical is a big troublemaker in the body. It, it really is. And so, uh, so much of the conventionally grown wheat, I would probably say all of the conventionally grown wheat, is drenched in this stuff before it is harvested. Um, and this glyphosate compound, this chemical, is uh, an antibiotic. It kills life, among so many other things. And it specifically kills life within our digestive tract. It kills our microbiome. And it leads to uh, vulnerable intestines. Um, but also, it it um, has a, a way of um, binding and associating with the gluten protein in a way that the immune system mounts a, an immune response against glyphosate, as it should, because it's a foreign substance that the body doesn't really want in the body. Um, but then the gluten protein is attached to the glyphosate in this kind of way. Um, and then we find clean wheat, non-glyphosate contaminated wheat, and our body, or, or clean gluten, I should say, a clean gluten protein not associated with the glyphosate chemical, and our body still confuses, has a tendency to confuse the gluten protein with the glyphosate. And it says, hey, I, I know you, Mr. Gluten. Usually, you're associated with that bad guy glyphosate over there. I'm going to go beat you up in the back alley. <laughs> and that, that's what the immune system does to the innocent gluten protein. Um, so really, gluten is innocent. It didn't do anything wrong. It's just been hanging with the troublemaker glyphosate for a little, far, little too long um, due to conventional farming practices. And now here's where we tell you, if you don't have an issue with gluten, if you don't have an issue with eating wheat products or rye or barley, then go for it eat the gluten containing grains. Um, but if you do have health issues that could be traced back to your microbiome or some intestinal inflammation specifically associated with eating these products, um, then maybe it's helpful to allow that kind of immune system to reestablish itself. Uh, but also, you know, while I'm opening up my mouth and blabbering, you know, it, it's once again helpful to understand that this gluten protein uh, it's so easy to be gluten-free when we're eating whole food plant-based because most of the wheat products, the barley products, and the rye products are consumed in processed foods. You know, we're talking about breads and pastas and other sorts of stuff where they jam these processed ingredients in. Now we can eat wheat berries or uh, rye. I don't know. I've never had rye. Rye berries? Rye berries. Rye groats? That's a thing. That's I don't a know. Thing. I've, <laughs> I've heard of rye berries now that you say it. 
Um, so. Right. But the thing to point out is that if you are fine with gluten and you choose to go ahead with eating gluten, you want to make sure that it is clean, organic, uh, you know, wheat, rye, or barley that you're eating and not uh, conventionally grown so that you're not introducing that glyphosate to your system. Oh, and we've got a very helpful assistant here. Thanks, Stephanie, for pointing out that she went to celiac.org and found that it's approximately 1 in 133 individuals who experience celiac disease. Um, so yeah, less than 1%. Still, mm -hmm. still a real thing that, you know, it, that those people definitely do better by avoiding entirely gluten. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt about it. Right. Even so, trace amounts. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit more about reversing food sensitivities. Yeah. We do have a full podcast episode on this topic, but you know, we're talking about it right now. So let's cover it. Yeah. You've mentioned a few really key points, Dr. Ben, that really our relationship or our, uh, you know, if we're at risk of developing food sensitivities, it really has to do with our gut health, our microbiome, uh, how robust and diverse our microbiome yeah. is. No, it's, it's, it's true. And, um, you know, when we experience some sort of symptom after eating a whole food of some sort, like a, a good natural unprocessed food, it's so common to say, oh, you know, that kale gave me a stomach ache, so I'm never going to associate with kale again. Kale is bad for me. Bye-bye, kale. See you never. Um, but really, we can have a totally opposite relationship with these foods. Like, oh, kale, why did that irritate my stomach? Well, it's because I have a disproportionate amount of, amount of bacteria in my gut, and specifically, not enough kale loving bacteria. So I'm going to inch my way into more kale territory so that I can diversify that aspect of my microbiome. And the same relationship can be had with gluten digesting microbes in our gut in our gut. But I'd say there's a caveat there. With the caveat of the glyphosate com conversation and the immune system rebalancing conversation. Um, but also the caveat that we should be eating these, these every, we, we should be, our, our food should be 99.9% .9 give or take whole foods if we want to really thrive. Mm -hmm. So that's, what was your caveat? Well, yeah, that, that big glyphosate piece, um, you know, so to take kind of a step back, uh, again, a reminder that food sensitivities really come when we have a lot of inflammation in the gut yeah. and we actually have what is called leaky gut syndrome, mm -hmm. where the gap between the uh, junctions of our intestinal cells are actually bigger than they should be. So certain undigested food molecules can actually move across the gut barrier into the bloodstream where they really shouldn't be in those big uh, molecular sizes. That's really what stimulates the immune response. So the reason why supporting the microbiome and optimizing digestive health is so important is because when we have that diverse, that robust microbiome, we get so many protective benefits from all of those good bacteria in the intestinal lining, mm -hmm. one of which or you want to talk? Well, no, go ahead. Finish, <laughs> I'm going finish on. your thought. One of which is that when we have that robust microbiome, they create something called a biofilm, which is a really helpful protective layer yeah. that actually sits on top of the intestinal lining and protects us against pathogens, protects us against toxins, protects us against glyphosate if it mm. were to come into our system. Yeah, so I do want to take a little step back to the fact that uh, another thing that glyphosate does to our gut um, doesn't it like associate with that zonulin protein yeah. within the gut mm -hmm. that actually not only does glyphosate directly kill microbes in the gut due to its antimicrobial, antibacterial uh, properties, but it also has a way of unzipping. I know people have talked about it like unzipping the tight junctions. Mm -hmm. So those tight junctions between the intestinal cells, glyphosate directly tears them apart so that we directly experience uh, leaky gut in the face of glyphosate exposure. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about reversing food sensitivities, uh, it's really important to mitigate glyphosate exposure, which means eating non-GMO foods, organically grown 
grains and legumes and these sort of things. Um, because, by the way, just kind of quick little side tangent, this glyphosate chemical is really abundantly sprayed on our GMO crops, specifically corn, canola, sugar beet, cotton seed, alfalfa. Is that it? I think that soy. Soy, of soy. course, soy. Um, so conventionally grown, those those products we want to avoid entirely, especially when they are conventionally grown. And canola, let's face it, that's just uh, a flower that's grown to create canola oil. Same, largely with a lot of the conventionally grown soy. It's just uh, a bunch of fillers and junk ingredients in our processed foods, as well as corn and all and alfalfa and all of these things. So these these junk ingredients need to be avoided in order to reestablish a healthy, diverse microbiome and stop really poisoning our microbes with glyphosate exposure. Yeah. Yeah. So to, again, address this question of reversing food sensitivities, I'll just, I'll just teach through my own experience with this. Can I? Um, Real briefly, I, I'm going to well, teach through it. I'm not okay, going to, yeah. Yeah, yeah because, uh, you know, I got to the point where I was really minimizing the amount of food I was quote unquote, able to eat because it brought on food sensitivity symptoms. And a lot of people find themselves in this little corner where it's like, oh, now I'm sensitive to broccoli and now I'm sensitive to carrots. And what do I do? Well, actually, the way to really reverse this is to first take out the biggest offenders, the animal products, the processed foods, mm -hmm. these foods that contain all the toxins and bacteria that continuously injure our intestinal lining and, and mess up our microbiome. And then we focus on bringing in actually more plants, more fiber that fuels the beneficial bacteria in our gut. Yeah. So like what you said, Ben, you know, with the carrot, let's say it was carrot I was sensitive to, we need to ease into it. We need to not overload the system with carrots, um, but eventually the microbiome rebalances and readapts. And I would like to say, I would go as far as to say that for people who do have a sensitivity to gluten, they actually need to kind of respond to it in a different way because the immune system has created this kind of memory. You know, it associates the gluten with glyphosate Sometimes it's really best for the individual to take a long vacation from any gluten to allow their immune system to really kind of recalibrate re re and forget about that uh, cross reaction between the gluten and the glyphosate. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just to answer some of the questions coming in in the chat here, uh, the symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity. Uh, they really can be anything from digestive specific to systemic inflammatory symptoms, so to speak. This is where the big catchphrase of inflammation. Oh, that's due to inflammation. Oh, this is due to inflammation. So Take some anti-inflammatories. Well, where is that inflammation coming from? It's coming from the gluten little bugger seep, seeping its way through the tight junctions of the intestinal cells and creating an immunological response. One of the natural healthy side effects of the immune system being activated is quote unquote inflammation. So Yeah, so that can show up as many things like headaches or brain fog or joint pain or skin issues. Mm -hmm. It can really show up in a lot of different ways. Oh, and Deborah answered yeah. the question. And uh, non-conventionally grown means non-GMO and organic. That is correct. Yes. Organic is the opposite of conventional in this context. Of, yes. our, of our foods. And, and non-GMO does not mean it is organic. Right. So, so non-GMO wheat is still drenched in uh, herbicide, in herbicides and pesticides um, yes. because there's, as far as I know, no such thing as GMO wheat. Um, even, and Yvonne has gone from, and she had a diagnosis of SIBO and switched to whole food plant-based eating. And that is awesome. And honestly, very very uh, opposed to the, the mainstream dietary nutritional diagnosis, if you will, or nutritional prescription, if you will, for SIBO. Usually it's reducing fiber, reducing plants, restricting, restricting. So I'm glad that you're going this direction. You will succeed. Yes. And um, yes, yes, yes. Any other good questions? Let's see. I have been following a whole food plant-based regime, regime for... For the past four weeks, but feel bloated, very 
every once in a while. Is this expected and will it go away? 100%. Yeah. Uh, bloating, it's really a, a matter of going from, I'll just say it, a low fiber diet because if you're not eating a whole food plant based diet, you're eating a low fiber diet. It might not be pathologically low, but you're eating a low fiber diet. And when you start eating whole food plant based, you're eating a high fiber diet. So the symptom of going from a whole, uh, a low fiber diet to a high fiber diet is gas and bloating as the microbiome is adjusting, is shifting, is ad adapting and evolving. So that's a good symptom and just kind of ease into it. Eat some cumin and peppermint oil and ginger and what are the other good foods that help to quench the gas and bloating? Cardamom. Cardamom, cinnamon. Cinnamon. Um, these kind of herbs can be really good. Yes. And then also just focus on the good quality. Make sure your foods are well prepared and organic and these kind of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And really cutting out the processed food. Yeah. Yeah. And then Marie gets bloated and has pain when she consumes gluten products. So, and that might be an indicator that it would be really best for you to take a break from the gluten. I would. Yeah. I would also say when you say gluten products, is it a slice of pepperoni pizza? Probably not. Probably not. Um, but is it a cupcake? Maybe. I don't know. What else is going in your mouth with the gluten? Because yeah. gluten gets wrapped up with all the processed ingredients and then it gets the finger where in fact, as you know, the, the, the reality is it's probably the combination, probably the processed nature of the foods, probably if anything, the glyphosate, um, probably you don't have celiac, but that I'm not, you know, you could be one in the 133. Yes, and um, going back to the point of you know how do you, how do you eat plant based without gluten? Well, as we mentioned, there are really just three plants <laughs> that we need to avoid. Um, yeah. Honestly, we're fine with gluten. I'm fine with gluten now, but we, but but we, we don't eat it because you know we, we have, don't cook wheat berries. Yeah, we, we have we have pizza maybe a couple times a year, mm -hmm. um, and we go out you know get our gluten containing pizza crust, the whole shebang. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but, uh, you know, the way I see it is it's, it's introducing those microbes in my gut to some new diversity, um, because that's what we want to do. We want to open the doors to our microbes, not close the doors. So don't put yourself into a restrictive corner. Um, and if you do have issues with gluten or any of the gluten containing grains, don't say goodbye forever. It, unless you really want to say goodbye forever, consider Tr doing a trial of a little bit of high quality this or that um, every once in a while to expose your microbes to some good alternative fibers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good maybe place to end it. I think for we today. did it. And, I think uh, we answered the question. I think we answered the question. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, should you eat gluten? The answer is yes, unless you're that one out of 30, 133, um, unless you really have severe issues, in which case you should heal the gut and then eat gluten. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is, uh, that's that. And, and yeah, we are maybe a little bit rebellious because most of our, uh, compadres in the holistic health, nutritional science kind of space, most people say, no, no, no gluten forever. Well, it's um, important to recognize that the wheat berries, the organic wheat berries, the organic rye berries, the organic barley, they have healing properties 100%. too, even though they contain gluten. Yeah. Our microbiome would benefit from having those berries from time to time. I, I did forget to say, I remember learning at some point that the wheat that we are eating today is very different from the wheat that we were eating 20 years ago. Um, because of the hybridization, I think is the term where the, 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 the wheat crops are bred in a way to have more gluten. Yes. Um, so that is a thing. That is a thing. Mm -hmm. But human beings have been eating glutinous containing greens, grains for millennia. Um, and uh, that's also a thing. So there's no reason to stop today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, yeah. Unless we're having issues. And Karen, um, how long does it take to heal the gut? Well, that definitely depends on the individual, okay. but, um, you know, it, it depends. What yeah. do you want to say? Uh, I, I, I just wanted to say that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends, and it depends what else you're doing for yourself. It depends how 
much of an opportunity you're giving your gut to heal because I would say it takes a day to heal your gut. It takes a day. Um, but most people don't give themselves a day. Um, so maybe three days. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. The uh, intestinal cells renew uh, every, every few days. Yeah. And then our microbiome is always repopulating and diversifying. So it takes a day or two or three to regenerate an entirely new intestinal system, intestinal cells. And then it takes forever to continue evolving, adapting, diversifying the microbes in our gut. But yeah. now is a good place to start. So yes. just a reminder that if you'd like to join us in the upcoming Whole Food Plant-Based Challenge, the Detox Series happening next Monday in the Plant-Based and Stress-Free group, um, go ahead and get registered and join the Facebook group if you're not already. Obviously, the people with us right now are obviously in the group. Yes. And if you are interested in working with us in a more intimate setting through our Thrive on Plants program, you're always welcome to join us there as well. You can learn more about that at our website, alter.health. Slash thrive dash on dash plants. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being with us. Hope you have a lovely rest of the week. And, until and next time. we'll be back next week for the challenge. All right. Peace and love. Bye for now.